Welcome to worship with us at Jerome Christian Church. We're glad you've joined us online today. We will be meeting online until things loosen up a little bit more in our distancing, but we're glad that you've joined us today. We hope that when that time comes, you'll be able to come and worship with us in person. We hope that you also have elements ready for communion a little later in the service today. Peter will be preaching in his series on the storms of life and dealing with those storms as we face them even today. And so we anticipate that great time of hearing the Word of God and also remembering Christ and the Lord's Supper. We uh, want to invite you to join us every time you have opportunity. And if you have any questions, we can be of any help to you, please call this number, 765-628-3126. If you have any prayer requests, please leave those prayer requests on the voicemail if no one answers at the office. We are keeping regular office hours, uh, somewhat diminished, but... Uh, regular hours during the week. Also, you can not only pick up your communion elements, but uh, we invite you to leave prayer requests and to kind of keep up. 765-628-3126. We certainly want to pray for our governor and for the governors of all the states and for our president, for all of his advisors, as we make this transition back into normalcy at the pace that is deemed best. And as a congregation, we want to participate with the authorities and do this optional online uh, worship time. And we probably will continue that after we regather in person because so many of you have joined us in this method and we hope that you will continue to do so. I'm going to invite you to begin prayer with the service time with me in prayer and then we will get right to our worship team and uh, to Peter's message from the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these who have come in together to, uh, to listen and to participate and to sing your praises. Even in the privacy of our own homes, Father, we lift our voices because you are worthy of our praise. Would you bless those who lead us and feed as he preaches the word of God and unfolds the word of life to us and as we remember Jesus at the Lord's Supper. Help us to know how and find creative ways to reach out to others, even with our own social distancing. We pray for wisdom for our leaders in decisions that are being made as we phase back into a sense of normalcy. We pray for peace and comfort for those who may be struggling through relationships that are, that are so close and so compact and, and not having the opportunity to be out and about. We pray, Father, for comfort through your Holy Spirit for those who trust in you. And Father, we pray that there'll be a great harvest of people coming to follow Jesus because we have been called back to the things of importance. We pray for those who are struggling, whose businesses are uncertain as they face the future. We pray, Father, for those who are on the very front lines to protect us and to serve those who are dealing with the issues of health and, and of emotion. And we pray your will to be done in us. We love you, Father. We worship you together today, joyfully, in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Bow down and go. 
I've been washed by the blood. Amazing grace, how sweet the Well, hello again, church. Let me begin with this. Whoever the smart aleck is that went up there on the window and put this up on the shade, thinking that I wouldn't notice and would record all of this, and then they could all laugh at me through the entire service, I'm too smart. Too observant. Thank you very much. I don't know who it was, but I'm guessing it was a green child and not the one named Lily. Probably the one named Jonathan. Nonetheless, it is good to be with the rest of you on this fine day. The other day I was having a Zoom meeting with one of my classes from Eastern High School, and after we got through talking about all of the school stuff, we just kind of started shooting the breeze a little bit. I think there was a general sense of, well, these are actual other human beings that we can talk to, our peers, which is nice. And one of them asked me a question, said, what is it that you're looking forward to most when all of this is over. And I'll tell you that it kind of caught me off guard a little bit. To be totally transparent and honest with you, 
I am guilty of concentrating too much these last few weeks on how annoying all of this is. Rather than spending my time concentrating and thinking about things that I'm looking forward to in the future, which is honestly probably a healthier way to do it. And so the immediate response that I gave, this is just the first one that came off the top of my head, it was to get back together and go to church with people again. And that's true. But after the call was over, I started thinking more about all of that. And I actually came up with my top five things that I'm most looking forward to once this coronavirus stuff is behind us. Once all these quarantines lift and the panic has subsided, let me give you, without further ado, the top five things that Peter Heck is looking forward to and anticipating at the end of the coronavirus freakout. Number five, going to a restaurant. Now, Jenny and I have been good, and we've tried to be good, about going and supporting local restaurants with carryout through these last few weeks, doing our part to eat out. And we've tried to hit locally owned ones, maybe a little bit more, even though even the chain restaurants, those are workers who are local who also need to be paid. But I got to tell you that one of the great pleasures in life, and I've realized this, is going and sitting and devouring basket after basket after basket of chips and salsa, either at Hacienda or Three Amigos. <laughs> you can't do that with carryout. Once you've eaten your allotted amount, once you've sucked up all of the salsa, it's over. Nobody's bringing you more, and I am ready for that to end. And honestly, a steak in a to-go container is not nearly as good as when it comes sizzling on a plate. So I'm ready to go to a restaurant again. Number four, getting a haircut. I mean, you can see this, but look at this back here. I mean, it's, it's getting ridiculous. It's starting to curl, which means pretty soon I'm going to look like this. It's either that or I'm going to break down and let Jenny do what she wants to do, which is get near my head with a pair of clippers, which means I'm going to come onto one of these videos with my hair looking like this, ready for a haircut. Number three, this, number three, and this may seem weird to you, but I bet not, not anymore. I'm really looking forward to seeing people out and about again, just people out places, crowds. These pictures from New York City are crazy to me and not very cool. Those streets should be full of people bumping into each other, giving dirty looks, trampling the stragglers. That's New York. That's what I want to see. Okay, not the trampling, but seriously, I never thought that I would live through a day when I would actually see more people walking between Subway and the Greentown Mini Mall than walking the streets of Broadway in New York City. That's just freakish, and I'm ready to see a return of the crowds. Number two. Okay, let me explain. I have allergies, and there are two really bad seasons for people who have allergies like I have. Harvest season, when the fields are full of dust and everything, and springtime. And springtime is by far the worst. It's when the pollen count is the highest. It's when all the ragweed is growing. Everything's budding and blooming, and you may all think that that's pretty, I think it looks like swollen eyes and nasal passages. And I gotta tell you, I'm really looking forward to being able to sneeze in public again without feeling like I'm a leper. The looks that some of you people give us sneezy people are totally uncalled for. I cleared out the post office the other day. I'm standing in line and I sneezed. I had to. And I sneezed into my arm and I was wearing a sweatshirt at the time. Totally muffled that thing. And you would have thought by people's reactions that I had just set fire to the building. Fire! Oh, fire! Okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. <laughs> People all jumped and ran the other direction. They were fleeing for their lives, all giving me dirty looks. I just said, my name is Phil Evenson. I'm really sorry. But in actuality, I'll tell you, I learned a quick way to move to the front of the line. People clear out for you like you're royalty. And that actually brings us to the number one thing I'm looking forward to. I admit that I am once guilty of having said that I would do anything if our media would just stop paying attention to the British royal family. No one cares about them. It's 2020, not 1400. But listen, my number one thing I'm most looking forward to is hearing about anything on the news anything that isn't coronavirus news. Tell me all about the Queen Mother and wherever she went last weekend. Tell me about the Dukes and the Duchesses. I'll listen to stories about Meghan Markle and Princes Larry, Curly, and Moe. 
Whatever, just let me hear something other than a coronavirus report. Anyway, that's my list. And I'm kind of curious what yours would be. I know that that seems weird, but if you get a chance, it's a neat activity that actually focuses your mind on positive things, and honestly, things that we took for granted. And if you want to share your list, I would actually really enjoy reading it. So do send it to me. But doing that, I'm going to tell you, it makes you aware of how many little things have changed. Things that we just came to rely on, like eating out Sunday after church. And I know that that was routine for a great number of you. You'd all start getting antsy in your seats whenever I went a little bit long in the message because you wanted to beat the Baptist to the restaurant. I would go on a Sunday afternoon for tea over at McAllister's, and some of you would still be sitting there. You'd unbuckled the belt, and you'd kind of lean back in the booth a little bit. Yes, I'm looking at you, Stokes and Sumters. I'm just saying. We all miss things that we used to do. We always did them. Visiting family, going to work, and we're finding ourselves now doing things that we've never done. Getting our mail with gloves on, sitting in the back end of our SUVs in an empty parking lot so we can visit with one another, socially distance properly. But as we continue in this little mini-series that we're doing in finding wisdom in our current storm, have you ever paused and considered what makes a storm scary in the first place? I know some people are into them, but if they're really bad storms, all of us get a little antsy. And why? In many ways, they're scary because they affect our perception of what we believed was safe and secure. Is that not accurate? Most of us enjoy going to ball fields or golf courses, but a fierce lightning storm tells us that those places are not safe. We love to go for a drive, we love to go to games and gymnasiums, but a tornado warning alters our perception about how safe those places are. You won't find a more stable concrete structure than a parking garage, but an earthquake will quickly change your perception on how safe and secure a place like that is. That's what makes storms scary. And all that we're dealing with right now has done that very same thing to us. It's shaken our perceptions. It's shaken our assumptions about things that we thought were secure. And we've been left feeling disoriented, off balance, uncertain, lonely. But listen carefully. There are places that you can go to be safe from the fiercest lightning. There are places that you can go to be safe from even the strongest tornado. There are places that you can go to be secure from even the most violent earthquakes. Places where those violent storms cannot touch you. And the exact same thing is true for us right now. There is a place you can go. There are things and realities that we can celebrate that haven't changed because they will never change no matter how fierce a storm around us may be. These are massive pillars that are established and dug down deep into something that is far more stable than even the deepest earth. This is eternal bedrock. And scripture tells us, that that's something that can never be shaken. I've already done one top five in this message, so I might as well do another. Write these down, dwell on them, cling to them, and find peace in them. Number five, God's Word. Now, we hit on this in our Scripture Alone message a few weeks ago, and if I can be totally honest, so long as you're listening to messages from me, this is a theme that we're going to keep coming back to over and over and over. It's my go-to. It's something that I am adamant about reiterating and repeating until everyone who hears me is sick of hearing it. God's Word is reliable. It is trustworthy. It is secure. Coronavirus does not call into question its trustworthiness or its truthfulness. His word is as sure and as firm now as it was before all of this began. Isaiah reminds us, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The psalmist says it this way, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. And Peter tells us, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of, look at this, imperishable, through the living and abiding 
word of God. So here's my humble suggestion for you this week. Spend at least as much time this week studying and reading the word of God as you do listening and watching the news. Force yourself to balance it. If you are going to watch the news because you need to, and you're going to watch an hour a day, then be in the word of God at least an hour a day. Here's number four. Things that don't change God's love and his purpose for us. God gave us a lot of things in his word. Now remember, God knows every secret in all of the universe. He created all things. There's no way we could ever have the mind of God. So when he gave us his word, he gave us the essentials. And in those essentials, look at what he tells us over and over again. In 1 Chronicles, way back in the Old Testament, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love, steadfast love endures forever. Steadfast, unchanging love endures forever. Nothing will alter it. He enshrined it into his everlasting law that he gave his children of Israel. Look in Deuteronomy. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and, look at this, steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. That would include us. And if God's love for us is unchanging, which it must be, because that's one of the things that he gave us, knowing he was only going to give us the essentials in his word, he gave us that confidence. If his love for us is unchanging, then his purpose for us is unchanging as well. It has to be. He hasn't brought us here to abandon us. That's not what you do when you love someone. He's brought us here, and he is empowering us. I want you to remember, and this is really, really important, I don't know if you can remember way back to when we did the Holy Spirit series or not, but part of the point of us receiving the Holy Spirit in us, the third person of the Trinity living in us, we welcomed him when we gave our lives to God in Christ. Part of the point of him filling us is what? For him to produce within us, God's children, Holy Spirit lives in us, and part of the point of him doing that is so that he can produce in us, within us, that very unchanging love of God. The world sees the unchanging love of God through those of us who have God, the Spirit, living in us. So we are being empowered in this moment to be witnesses to a lost world about God's love. We are on offense in these days. We are not cowering, scared in a corner, worried about what tomorrow may bring. We are more than conquerors. We are servants, evincing in a supernatural way, a way that no one can explain apart from the existence of God, the very love of the keeper of all tomorrows. That is his purpose for us, and it is certainly unchanging In these days. And because his purpose remains constant, we have an enduring hope, a strong, confident expectation that holds us securely through life like an anchor does when a ship is in the midst of a storm. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Are you clinging to it or are you cowering? If you need to make that change, make it this week. Number three, and this one's going to get you. I know we haven't forgotten about it, but I'm inclined to say that maybe we deprioritize our awareness of it when we're in the midst of something that's different. The awareness of this amazing gobsmacking, write that word down, reality. Get a load of this. Jesus, the Savior, our Savior, the Messiah of all humanity, was interceding before the Father on our behalf before coronavirus, and this current storm that we're dealing with hasn't slowed that or stopped him. Jesus is the master of all things, and this current reality that affects us so much in no way alters his control or mastery of all things. And he has chosen to do something on our behalf, and he is still doing it. Right now, he is pleading his death and the power of his resurrection for us 
before the throne of his father. In this very moment, whenever you're watching this, that's what he's doing. Whoa, that's amazing to me. You remember what the job, the role of the priest was in the Old Testament? They would go on behalf of the people into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, where the Spirit of God would be present. That's why there was that gigantic curtain that separated everybody else from the Holy of Holies because God's presence was there. And so the priest would go in and offer a sacrifice of atonement on behalf of the sins of the people. The priest would intercede on behalf of the people. He was offering sacrifices, the priest was, pleading with God to turn from his righteous anger towards the sins of the people, accept the sacrifice of atonement, and grant the people favor rather than judgment. And remember, when Jesus dies at Calvary, one of the most profound things that happens in all of that is that the curtain that separated that Holy of Holies was ripped top to bottom. And why? Because what Jesus had done was made a once-for-all sacrifice, removing the need any further for a priest to intercede on our behalf. Hebrews says it this way, He became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, You are a priest forever. Because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. That's what he's doing right now. Wow. Number two, just a warning, this one's going to be a little bit more daunting than the rest of them that I've given, but it's an important reminder. Judgment Day has not changed because of coronavirus. Meetings canceled. The opening day of Little League is postponed. <laughs> Seasons altered, conventions shifted, vacations uprooted. But this, this is important for us to remember. We all have an upcoming appointment that will not be delayed, it will not be rescheduled, it will not be altered by our earthly circumstances. Look what Luke writes. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. I'm not trying to sound clever or droll here, but you are not going to be sending a proxy, a substitute, to that meeting for you. Paul told the Corinthians as much. He said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So again, I make this suggestion in love. As you frantically try to remake your schedule, you're trying to reschedule meetings and appointments and vacations and trips, please give ample time, give ample thought to the meeting and the appointment that is looming for all of us that will not be rescheduled or postponed. And finally, number one, the greatest unchanging promise of them all. Our final destination is not changed a bit by everything that's going on. This virus is reshaping our journey in a direction we weren't expecting. For some of us, it's really annoying. For others of us, it's really scary. For some people, it's produced a great amount of grief. But listen, even though our journey has taken a quick jaunt down a path that we weren't expecting, the end is the same. When we get where we're going, we'll enter a city, a future city that will last forever, where there's a great, big, beautiful wall that coronavirus and every other virus will never, in all eternity, be able to penetrate. Hebrews 13 says, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. The servants of God in that new Jerusalem, according to Revelation's promise, will reign forever and ever. That future final destination for all of us, it isn't altered by anything that's happening here because it isn't here, it's in heaven. We have, according to Peter, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Jesus said it himself in those most amazing opening verses of John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Am I not reliable? 
If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. We do know the way. It is through him. Is it okay to scramble while we try to adjust to this change? Yes. Is it okay to hurt over things lost and altered by the change? Yes. Is it okay to express frustration about our circumstances? Of course. But, and this is a very important but, we have what others do not. We have unchanging truths to cling to, and that separates us. They hold us in steady balance, and living that way will glorify God in a very profound way as we navigate these days. And that's what we're in this for, right? To glorify God, God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Welcome to our time of communion. I hope that you have your elements ready for celebrating the Lord's Supper. We have these available at a church if you'd like to stop by during business hours. And on the west entrance, you can pick up these single-serve communion preparations for your own celebration next week.
You and I are friends of Jesus, followers of Jesus. But who is he really? Start to finish, the Gospel of John in the New Testament is the definitive answer to that very question, who is Jesus? It opens up with a stunning, dazzling description. Jesus is the unique Word of God. The Word was with God. In the beginning, the Word was with God and the Word was God. Now, to John's original readers, this would have made much more sense than it initially does to us. Jewish readers, for example, would have remembered the same words in the beginning, going back to the first book of the Bible and the account of creation. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word. They would have recalled all that the prophets had said about the Word of the Lord. By contrast, from their culture perspective, the Greeks would have thought of the word as the meaning of life, the, the reason, the purpose behind all of the universe. John's opening description would have been electrifying to both groups. Nick Gumbel describes it this way. He says, I'm going to tell you all about what you have been searching for all this time. You see, Jesus is the word. The word, word means the ultimate description of God. In John 1, 14, it says that this word became flesh and lived with us. He came and dwelt among us. At the beginning of everything, Jesus was with God, he was God, and he is God. He is the word. He's also the unique creator of all. Verse 3 says, everything that was created came through him. Nothing, not one thing came into being without him. Through him, the entire universe came from nothingness to completeness. And in Colossians 1.16, we see this summary. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He's the unique word. He's the unique creator of all. He's the unique light of the world. Verse 4 says, in him was life. And the life was the light of all the people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light is a representation of truth and goodness. Darkness is a symbol of evil and falsehood. Light and darkness are opposite, but they are not equal. A tiny candle can light a large room and take away the darkness and will not be diminished or dimmed by it. Light is stronger than darkness. Darkness cannot prevail against light, and evil cannot prevail against Jesus, the unique light of the world. He is also the unique transformer of our lives. In verses 12 and 13, it says, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, not born of natural descent or human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. When you are born of the water and the Spirit through Jesus, the Father receives you into his own family. Next, we see Jesus is the unique revelation of God. In verse 18, we read, No one has seen God, but the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. Everything in the Old Testament leads up to God's supreme revelation in Jesus Christ. Verse 17 of John 1 says, Grace and truth came through Jesus all the way through the Bible. God is looking for a response, your response and mine. He gives us the opportunity to become children of God. And finally, we see Jesus is the unique Savior. There is absolutely nothing more wonderful than taking hold of salvation and a relationship with God through obedient faith in Jesus Christ. When you put your trust in him, when you turn from the evil that has separated you from him, when you confess him as your Lord, when you're baptized into him, you receive remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that transformational moment will be with you forever. In the Lord's Supper, we each week remember that transformational remembrance, that, that transformational experience, and we Express our gratitude to God every time. I hope you have your emblems ready. Jesus took bread and he said, this is my body. He took the cup and said, this is my blood. Let's pray about that.
and then partake together. Father, today in this moment we pause to give you thanks for your sending your Son into the world for each of us. And as we contemplate his willingness to go to the cross to pay our sin debt, we are drawn to love you even more. We see in his broken body, in this bread represented, we see his, see his shed blood in this cup. And we take these emblems with inexpressible gratitude. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your life for ours. In you is grace and truth. Help us in these transitional times in our lives to live with those who are closest to us as we shelter in place, to live with them with grace and with truth daily. We come before you, Father, for help in the things that we do and the words that we speak. May both be full of your grace and truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Jesus took bread and broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In like manner, he also took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It may be soon. At any rate, have a great week trusting in him as the unique son of